we are now ready to calculate and create a confidence interval for a proportion. <clears throat> Here's the example. Harris Health Systems expects that at least 87% of their employees get a flu shot every year. They don't have the time to ask all their employees, so they decide to take a sample of 300 and then estimate the true proportion of all employees that receive their flu shot. Of the 300 employee samples, 249 said they received their shot in the last year. We need to create a 95% confidence interval and determine whether or not that 87%, whether it's reasonable to conclude that they met that goal. A lot of information here. Once we're done with that, we are then going to create another confidence interval to see if that conclusion changed. So let's just write down what we know. I know that a sample of 300 employees was taken. So just from that, I know the number of employees here was 300. And of that 300, I had X, which is the observations, 249 said that they received their flu shot. When we are estimating the population parameter, the first thing we should do is to create the point estimate. So a point estimate in this case is our p hat. And this is just the ratio of 249 to 300. 249 said that they had a flu shot out of the 300. So if we use just our sample proportion, we will get, if we round this, and we don't need to round it, it is exactly equal to 0.83. So we have a proportion of 0.83, and if we convert this to a percent, it would be 83%. It's a little bit less than 87, but we know that there could be sampling error. Right? This could just be one sample of the 300. Perhaps another sample would be 0.89 and give us 89%. So let's use this point estimate to create a confidence interval. We know we're going to have to add a margin of error, right? We're going to have to take p hat and add and subtract this margin of error. But the first thing, after we create the point estimate, is to determine the level of significance and the z-score that we'll need. So if we're creating a 95% confidence interval, that means our level of significance is 0.05, right? That is the percentage outside, or the proportion outside. If we split that in half, we know of the bell curve, we're going to have two tails with our double-sided confidence interval. So we're going to have an area of 0.025 in each tail. And the z-score that has 0.025 in each tail is going to be equal to 1.96. That 1.96, as I've mentioned before, it's going to be a good one to memorize. That 1.96 is going to be the z-score that we use to estimate and create a 95% confidence interval. Okay, we have the point estimate. We realize that we're going to need 1.96 in our margin of error. Now let's calculate that margin of error. Remember, the margin of error for a proportion is that critical value. How much are we going to add and subtract in terms of the standard error? And then multiply by the standard error. So this is p hat times q hat divided by n. So when I plug this in, I know that the z value is 1.96. That's the z score associated with a 95% confidence interval. And I'm going to multiply that by p hat, which is 0.83. Now we didn't do q hat. q hat is going to be found by taking 1 minus 0.83. So in this case, q hat is going to be equal to 0.17. We forgot to do that, but that's okay. We can, it's not very complicated. Q hat is 1 minus P hat. So we're going to multiply this by 0.17. And we're going to divide by our sample size, which was 300. Now, when you put all of this in your calculator, be careful here. It might be helpful just to find what's underneath the square root, then take the square root of that and multiply it by 1.96. Or if you have a graphing calculator and you're okay with the order of operations where you're using parentheses, you could put that entire expression into your calculator. Again, just be careful you're using parentheses where appropriate. The margin of error then is going to be if we round this to the hundredth place. Actually, let's round this out to the thousandths place, 0 0.043 approximately. Let's round that out. Now, finally, we are ready to create our confidence interval where we will take our p hat and add our margin of error 
and then we will take our p hat and subtract our margin of error. So our p hat plus is going to be 0.83. Let me just draw a line here to separate. 0.83 plus 0.043. And then down here, we'll have 0.83 minus 0.043. So let's see. The lower bound, the 0.83, when we subtract that margin of error, you will get 0.787. And the upper bound, when you take 0.83 and you add 0.043, you get 0.873. So we have a lower bound of 0.787 and an upper bound of 0.873. What can we conclude? Well, if we look at what the estimate was, it was 0.8, or our proportion that they were hoping for was 0 0.87. 0 0.87 is contained in this interval. So we could say there is evidence to support this claim or their expectation that the population proportion is actually you know, 0.87 and that that's the percentage of employees that got a flu shot. It didn't necessarily look like it based on our sample, but it's still possible, right? It's definitely still possible. If you were to write out what this was, what this is, um, this interpretation, you would say we are 95% confident that the true population proportion, the true proportion of employees that got a flu shot, is between 0.787 and 0.873. We would not say there's a 95% chance, or there's a 0.95 probability. That's not how we interpret confidence intervals. Now we want to create a 99% confidence interval and determine whether or not our conclusion changes. Based on this approach, if we are going to be more confident, if, if our confident, confidence level has increased from 95 to 99, think about what's going to happen to our margin of error. If we wanted to be more confident, is our margin of error going to increase or decrease? Think about that for a second. You should be able to answer this question even without calculating. It's still going to be good practice, but you would think that our conclusion will stay the same. The reason why is we can expect our margin of error to increase. So we still have, in this case, the same p hat, which is 0.83. We still have the same q hat, which is 0.17. The only thing that's changed here is our z-score. We now do not want an alpha level of 0.05, but we have an alpha level of 0.01 where 1% or an area of 0.01 will lie outside of our bell curve, our, our interval, which means if I split that in half, we need an area of 0.005 in each tail. So the z-score that has 0.005 in each tail will be 0.2 or 2.575. That also is a good one to memorize. This is the z-score associated with a 99% confidence interval. Now we're still going to add and subtract the margin of error, but now the margin of error is going to be slightly different. Instead of having 1.96, we are now going to be multiplying our standard error by a larger z-score. We still have the same values in here, right? Our standard error, this is the standard, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, this is still the same. The only thing that changed in this example was we're now multiplying by a larger z-score. So let's put this in our calculator. Again, being conscious of when you are multiplying, when you are dividing, and when you're using square roots, you are putting in parentheses where appropriate. We get a margin of error, if we round this out to the thousands place, 0.056. So when I take p hat and add the margin of error, and when I take p hat and subtract the margin of error, what do I get? So we'll get, let's see, 0.83 plus 0.056. The upper bound is going to be 0.886. And the lower bound, if we subtract, we'll get 0.774. So we could write this in an interval as an, excuse me, as an inequality. We would expect with 99% confidence that the true population proportion would fall between these two values, 0.774 and 0.886. It makes sense that our inter interval is now larger. 
we, we want to have a little bit more confidence. All right? I mean, we want to increase our confidence, so we have to increase more values. So our conclusion didn't change. 